I want you to ask yourself the question, what myths or misconceptions might be holding me back? So if you can go fight those battles for me, that'd be great. <laughs> um, so before I do any Kanban talk, I always want to make sure that I talk to people what I'm talking about. Because we use the word Kanban a lot. It's heavily overloaded and sometimes used, we're talking about two different things, and then they have an argument about it. So who here is familiar with the Kanban method? Oh, more people than I expected. Um, have you ever had this conversation before where you've been talking about Kanban and then you realize that you weren't talking about the same thing with somebody? It's really good to start a conversation about what are we talking about. So quickly, for those of you who don't know the Kanban method, there is the word Kanban. It is a Japanese word. It means signboard. We've converted it slightly into like a visual cue, something I can see, something that provides information, radiates information. That's a Kanban. Who went to Starbucks today or a coffee shop? You were a part of a Kanban system, if you've ever done that, right? The cup appeared on the barista bar. The barista's like, hey, I've got work. I saw the cup. No one told me anything, right? That's a Kanban. A Kanban system, I like to say it's a pull-based work management technique. Um, I, whip limits are a tool that help you get to pull, but a Kanban system is a pull-based work management technique in our context, right? So it happens to use Kanban to provide information about what's in flight, when do I have capacity to pull, provide information to other people in the system. So a Kanban system tends to use Kanban to provide information to allow us to make better decisions about when to pull. And then there's the Kanban method. You know, so as Dave said today, um, in the keynote, I didn't name it at the beginning. <laughs> so then he named it the Kanban method. Um, and that's good because it uses virtual Kanban systems and it uses Kanban, or it advocates the use of Kanban visualizations to, uh, to help us make better decisions or to make just-in-time decisions. But the Kanban method is not a software development lifecycle methodology. It isn't, in and of itself, a work management technique. It is an approach to incremental and ev evolutionary process change for organizations. Right? It happens to advocate the use of Kanban systems to allow us to create an environment where we can be kind to our employees, let them pull the work that they're capable of, it likes, to use, it likes to use Kanban visualizations to radiate information. And there's a really interesting aspect to that visualization. It's not just put a board card on a wall. It's make sure that your work is visible, right? I go to lots and lots of corporations, helping them, and it's like, what is the number one thing that slows you down? And some of them, they say, well, I, I get interrupted all the time. Do you keep track of that work that you did when you're interrupted? No. Well, when it was invisible, right? You treated it as an invisible thing, and no one could see the information that you were working on it. So there's two aspects of that visualness that the Kanban method wants you to use, and it wants you to use Kanban method, Kanban systems to create a more humane way to manage our work. So make sure when you have a conversation about Kanban, and I'll probably use the word Kanban now, and I'm meaning the Kanban method, mostly, um, make sure that you know the conversation you're having whenever you go up and talk to people about Kanban. When you, when you hear people talking about Kanban, try to see what it is that they are talking about because it'll help you be more informed about their intents, what they are talking about. It'll allow you to make more informed decisions. And the thing that I would like you guys to really take away from this, it is a topic about myths and misconceptions. Why? In my personal journey through Kanban and growth and, and trying to help people adopt all of this thinking in the last two years, it's been the word why. Why did that work? Why is it behaving that way? Why did you not do that when I asked you to do it? <laughs> right? When we take the word why, we start to peel back 
the, the, the uncertainty, or we start to dig into the vagueness of our situation. And I find that the word why is like water on the witch, the witch being myths and misconceptions. If you say why to a myth or a misconception, it's like it loses its power, right? As a part of this, uh, my incentive to do this, you know, I, I, there were people who I thought were being dishonest with information about the Kanban method. And then I realized we're actually just not, they're good people, but they just had goals. They had motivations. So they create information or they create things. So these myths and misconceptions are definitely context sensitive. They are from your perspective. You need to ask why until you've satisfied yourself that you now have the answer. So a little bit about myth and misconception. I've been using those words. Myth is an idea or story that is believed by many people, but that is not true, okay? If a whole bunch of people in this room believe the sky was green, that would be a myth. <laughs> it's just not true. A misconception is slightly different. A view or an opinion that is incorrect because it is based on faulty thinking or understanding. You know, if I think that that color up there in the sky is blue, but I actually call it green, or I have some sort of deductive process that would identify it as green, that process might be faulty. And that's more of a misconception. And one more thing. I don't want you to believe me today. I'm here to make you curious. <laughs> I'm make, here to make you challenge whether I am creating myths. I don't want to create myths. I don't think that I am. But again, they're from your perspective. You need to go and chase down these things and determine if they're true. You will grow in that journey. I did just make that up. <laughs> oh, and I should mention, um, I'll, I'll point you to Frank Vega in a talk that he has uh, later on at the end of the slide deck. But he has that the greatest learning occurs at the interface of disagreement. I think that Frank means this when two people have a disagreement they can have a lot of learning going on there right and i definitely challenge you to challenge me on these things that i'm going to bring up but i think this also the interface of disagreement is your own disagreement with the world around you if you find that boundary you will have an opportunity to learn so uh, look for those opportunities to learn so I had five specific ones. Um, if we have time, I'm going to try and get through these quickly, but if we have time, I'll take more at the end. The first one, this was one that made me angry and not really made me angry, but it's like people are compare, want to say that Kanpan method competes with Scrum. There's supposed to be a one up there. I'm, I'm cut off. It's all right. And I want to say that, you know, when I first heard this, it's like a long time ago. It's like, oh, maybe that's true, yeah because I thought of Kanban really as a work management, I th I th my focus was the work management aspects of, of, uh, of Kanban. But then I realized that it's kind of an apple and oranges conversation. So the thing about the Kanban method is it's, it's pretty simple. There's four principles and six practices. These things, if you're in the Kanban community, generally think that these are good things. And they're principles. There's no real way to do these things. Let's just think this way. Does Scrum provide anything like this? Thoughts? Scrum doesn't come up with principles. It tells you how to do things. What gives you ways of thinking in the Agile community? The Agile Manifesto. So the values and principles of the Kanban method actually are com more comparable with the Agile, like you know, you would have a conversation about comparing it with the Agile Manifesto. But the really cool thing about, I found with these values and principles is that they're actually, there's no conflict, <laughs> right? These are all good things, and these are all other good things that are more specific to the, to the way that software development organizations tend to work but they're all good things. So I don't see if this is a competition, it's additive. So then we get onto the, the practices. Now this is where Kanban's telling you how to do things, right? Now this, 
might be something that, we com that competes with Scrum, right? Who here has read the Scrum Guide? A couple people in the room. It tells you how to do Scrum. And it sort of suggests that if you are not doing these things, you're not doing Scrum, which is a different problem. <laughs> but this is prescriptive. And on the surface, this might look prescriptive. But I like to actually think about these things as what I call meta tactics, <coughs> right? Has David ever told you how you must visualize your work? Well, that there's only, sorry, that there's only one way to visualize your work. No. I've seen, the, everybody has seen boards. I've seen pictures of Lego towns that indicated work or some workflow. Lots of different kinds of those things. How do you limit whip? We saw one, uh, Ed uh, had one today where he had little markers. It wasn't the numbers at the top of the columns. They did it by limiting the number of markers that are in their backlog. I want to quickly, but this, you know, he says these things are good things to do, but I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do them. So it's not really like Scrum, which is prescriptive and says you should do Scrum. You, if you're going to do Scrum, you have to do it this way. And if you don't, you're not doing Scrum, which is where derogatory words like Scrum butt, Scrum or fall, Yep. I don't want to spend too much time, but I had this conversation with Ken Schwaber, and he was just, he had a different way of thinking about that. And that's where he, like, that's where it's, it's not, he doesn't use Scrum butt. He says it's not Scrum. Right. Anyways, there's very little guidance on specific implementations of these things. There are more so in the Scrum world. So it's, 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 it is sort of there, but the Kanban method actually complements any methodology if it's homegrown, if it's the one that exists that you haven't even documented yet, the Kanban method complements your approach. It will add information in that's valuable. It will add valuable behaviors into your organization to help you become better. Remember, it, it is an incremental evolutionary process change, an approach for that. That's what it's mostly doing. Why is it doing it? Well, to increase our service delivery capabilities and do it in a humane fashion. But that is fundamentally sort of what it is. A couple of differences though, Kanban practitioners tend to like smaller batches of things. So we like work item, not iteration. Um, we prefer cadences as opposed to time boxes. I'll to cover that in a second. And again, I think the Kanban method encourages process evolution. I don't think Scrum does. Not the way that I have had conversations with Scrum practitioners and the way I read the guide and the w just, I know that it's, an, it's something that we want. And I think that the existence of Scrum Bon and Scrum-ish like things um, and people wanting to say that they're doing Scrum but they're not doing Scrum is an indication that it needs to happen but Scrum the guide doesn't necessarily advocate that evolution. Myth number two, the Kanban method is iterationless. And who here knows what iteration is? Right, it's a time box, right? That's what an iteration is. We happen to fill it up with a bunch of stuff that we think we can get done inside of that time box. And we tend to tag some rituals on at certain points. In the Scrum sense, it's at the beginning and at the very end, which is the same time, but just continuous, right? Kanban can do that. If we think about these things as cadences and I want to do something every two weeks, that would be a time, that would be an iteration. And if I lined up a uh, customer acceptance and a deployment and a retrospective every two weeks, I would have an iteration, except I don't necessarily want to call it an iteration. I want to call it a cadence. And I just have to have a whole bunch of cadences for activities lined up. 
where Kanban gets the iterationless uh, moniker is that it tends to be able to split them across. I want to do my customer acceptance every two weeks. I want to do my prioritization every week. And they'll meet up at some point. But it works. But cadences are still very important. That repeatability is important to human beings. And part of the reason the Kanban exists is because we like heartbeats. It's not required, exactly. It's not encouraged, actually, it's, uh, I believe, encouraged not to be synchronized. I don't know if I would use the word encouraged to not be synchronized. It just encouraged to find the optimal rhythm for the partner. Because usually time, usually those, those activities are interface points with external or external partners. And I, would, I always guide my teams to find the optimal cadence to interface with those teams based on both needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and that's what the thing, that's where Kanban gets the moniker of being iterationless, but we don't like to use the time boxes as confining. We actually like the cadences and have them aligned naturally to when they should be occurring for those partner organizations. If my customer can only test once a month, but I can prioritize once every two weeks, and my deployment group can only manage a deployment once every two months, that's the, that's the state of the world. Let's not fight that. Would it be better if we could sort of have it happening sort of continuously? Absolutely. But the time box sometimes provides a lot of consternation amongst partners in your development art process. I would point out that I'm sure you're using examples here, um, but it doesn't mean they couldn't happen. But mm -hmm. if you're in an environment where you do continuous deployment, for example, um, and where you just backlog or, or whenever you <coughs> just in time planning, so I'll just start to start and you're developing right. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. Like, if this cadence is once an hour, like, somebody's going to go check their board once an hour to fill up a whip slot. I mean, we're at the point of my team where the only cadence we really have is our retrospective, and that's... Yes. Like yeah, yeah. We do one once every couple of weeks just to hold everything on the Absolutely. Make sure we do that to do that. Yeah, yeah. Cadence. For sure. So again, that's sort of, if people say that Kanban is iterationless, it, it can have iteration-ish feel, but we prefer to use the word cadences, and I think it allows for a more holistic approach to interface, like finding that optimal place to interface with your partners. Myth number three is that it works for IT ops and not for projects. So what makes ops projects different? Is it less capable people? No. Is it poor quality systems? Well, they're doing a lot of ops work and maintenance work, but no, we make bad greenfield applications. Is it poor management? What makes an ops team different than a project team? The size of the batch. The sizes of the batches, for sure. It's not in our company. Pardon me? Not in our company. <laughs> it's one big batch of bad, or? No, no, it's you because they're just continuously deployed. Oh, okay, yeah, right, right, right. The batch times are enough. Right. So in my experience, the primary difference between ops work and project work is just the highly variable nature in which ops work will be discovered. We don't actually plan for outages or bugs or whatever that need to be fixed right now. That's really the only difference that I've seen, right? So when we say that Kanban can't work for projects, it's kind of wrong. Here's a really simple Kanban system. OK, ready, I'm doing something, I'm done, right? Here's a product backlog. It's uncommitted work. It's not in the Kanban system. Just a big pile of good stuff. It's going to be prioritized. I just need to, once every two weeks, replenish my ready queue. Right? 
flows through to done. It's simple. And it works really good for when we have issue management or ticking management where we have a lot of emergence, emergent work. It goes sort of into the same backlog, gets prioritized amongst the project work, and it flows through the system. It gets pulled in and flows through the system. So Kanban actually doesn't care whether you're in a project or whether you have emergent work like IT ops. The it's Dell. Exactly. And that's, I mean, I leave that point until later on because I don't want to be totally bashing on Scrum. I do, I thought Scrum advanced us so far. Well, it had the potential to advance us so far. I just think that it shouldn't have been thought of as the end of our improvement. I think Kanban might be the next step. Anyway, so we've got that, all that work just goes into our dev team and they just do it. Whether it's done as a project work or as done as IT ops work. This one sort of burns it gets me mad a little bit. It's a mini, it's, I've been seeing Kanban called a mini waterfall. Who's heard this? Okay, Kanban's a mini waterfall. Okay, so we all know what that looks like, right? That's a waterfall. Damn you, waterfall. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> well, if I stopped after this one, it would be a waterfall too. It just got drew different. But at least this one, it signals the intent that I'm going to continuously do it more. Right? So what's the difference between these? Like if I did one of these and stopped here, they're no different, right? What's the difference between these two idioms, ideas? Well, there's, well, maybe. Right, it's the batch size. I think that's the primary difference, right? Between these two diagrams, right? I have 500 things I need to do. I got a big project. If I were to say that my batch size between phases of life for this were 500, what would you, how would you characterize that project? Waterfall. If I did it like this, 250. <laughs> I've probably got two phases of a big project that are still really big black boxes that are going to probably struggle. What's this look like? Scrum, right? What does that one look like? <laughs> this looks like a Kanban system that's focused on one item at a time. Now, one is, might not be the optimal batch size. It's a very flexible and powerful batch size, but it might not be the optimal one. But that's where, you know, it's like when people say, oh, they see the, the Kanban board and they see stuff flowing through it, and then they say, oh, well, it's, it's mini waterfall. It's really not. Think about the batch size. This is my interpretation. Um, I think it's, I think about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> micro, this is micro, micro, micro waterfall. Exactly. So it is not a waterfall method. Um, lastly, work items, who's heard that it requires work items to be the same size and it doesn't estimate? We still estimate. We still want estimates. Why? Well, it's, it's more than that. We want to be able to set expectations, especially when Kanban systems, and we have upstream and downstream partners, we need to be able to schedule amongst those Kanban systems. We want to be able to set, set expectations. Uh, I, this, to me, is kind of a, a, a it's a good metaphor. Um, a road is a really diverse, it's got a whole bunch of different sized things on it but we all know about how fast they're going. We can usually measure how they're flowing through the system. We have some space for variability. If a semi breaks down, we can move it off the side. If an emergency vehicle has to come through, it can get through. We have things that allow it to work. So we have these, this flow that has a variety of different sized and complexity things that works and becomes very predictable. Why? We like to measure. And I don't, want to, I, I, I don't want to measure for measurement's sake, but we need to understand how quickly work flows through our workflow if we want to have some ability to set expectations. So we need to measure things, and I will count on you to go back and look at Drunken Cod's deck and pick the right things to measure. But we need to observe. We need to look at the thing, we need to observe the system, and we need to categorize our work. And this is where I think that 
the categorization is actually what we should be trying to do as knowledge work teams with, um, with Kanban. Don't try and estimate it. Just say that it looks like that other thing. That thing, 85% of the time, will be done in about eight days. So if it looks like that thing, which I'm pretty good at as a human being, I think that looks like that thing. I can actually have a meaningful chance of actually hitting that expectation. And then I can actually watch it work, and I can see if it was an outlier or not. And I can modify my behavior. I can modify my categorization. I can try to understand why did it not meet my expectations or everybody's expectations. And that's really what Kanban is advocating when it says, no, don't estimate, don't worry about size. Um, Kanban advocates that in informed predictions based on observed system behavior and understood or defined work item types. If I do this, I should be able to start to make probabilistic forecasting technologies work. Right? I can make informed decisions because I know how my system actually works. So it, it's not that it doesn't want you to provide set try and set expectations. It just doesn't believe in the traditional agile estimation techniques that we currently use today, which I think, I believe, don't work. I've seen them work, but then they start to drift and they get fudged and they don't really work over the long term. With that one in mind, I mean, Troy's in the back of the room. He's going to have a talk about this tomorrow. You, have, you really, to, to dig into more into that no estimates thing, or the no, not lack of estimation, go to his talk. Uh, look on uh, Twitter, no estimates. You'll just find a whole bunch of links. You'll probably find Drunken Cod, Neil Killick. There's a whole bunch of people who are involved in that. Or just Google Kanban probabilistic forecasting and you'll start to find Troy's stuff too. So this is a quick summary slide. It's more here for you guys uh, for when you get the slide deck again so you can sort of get my points. Um, I'm out of time. Quickly, there are other people who came before me and hopefully that will come after me. Not these guys. Um, Frank Vega, he had a really good video about myths and misconceptions at Chicago. Jeff Patton also had one from LSSC 12. Go watch them because they'll talk to you about myths and myths, myth busting uh, for yourself. Anyways, um, thank you very much. I kept you a little bit longer than I should have. I hope that's okay. Um, but if you, you can find me at Agile Ramblings or agileramblings.com. I would love to hear your feedback. And I don't know if we have to get out of the room if we're on a coffee break, but I'll hang out if you guys want to talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>